You know, slavery has a long history. When you read the history of human beings and the history of war, you hear about slavery. When people fought wars and they had prisoners of war, they took them as slaves. But in terms of recording, we begin to see slavery in Sumeria, in the Western tradition. That is when you begin to see the emergence of slavery during conflict, as I've already said, when people were conquered and they were subdued by one civilization, they would then be enslaved. And in many cases, you see this also articulated in different histories. Look, for example, at the Hindu Mahabharata, which is several years older than the Christian Bible. You see evidence of slavery, and when you look at the Talmud of the Jews, you see slavery. When you go to the Chinese and Oriental tradition, you see slavery. When you come to Europe and you begin to talk about the conquest of the Visigoths and Ostrogoths and the Romans, you see slavery. The Christian Bible itself in the Old Testament has slavery. In African tradition, when you look at Northern Africa, you see slavery. When you look at Islam, you see slavery. So it would appear that the human being's inclination to dehumanize fellow human beings who are not like them and to use them as vessels and chattels is something that is settled in history and it has changed character over the years. The tragedy, however, is that slavery is alive and well in different forms. I remember when I read different histories in the manner that I've articulated, you see that women and children were part of, of the war spoils. And that in itself tells you that slavery is part of human life, undesirable as it is. You know, when we talk about contemporary slavery, particularly in the continent of Africa, we've got to look at it from a number of dimensions. We do not talk as often as we should about the slavery that took place in the eastern coast of Africa from the year 650 AD. The enslavement of African peoples by the Arab Emirates, if you may, the Omani Empire and all those empires, this started in 650 AD, as I've already said. And estimates now suggest that as many as 18 million Africans were taken from the eastern coast of Africa, from what is today Kenya, Tanzania, up to the hinterland in places such as Malawi, and were taken to the Arab world. One of the things that happened in the Arab world, why you don't see the evidence of black slaves, is that they were castrating men. And therefore, they did not produce. And it is something that we don't talk about as loudly as we should. It's not as documented in the manner that it should. But that is the first wave of slavery in modern day slavery. The much more known wave of slavery starts in the 15th century. And this is by the European enslavers uh, in, in, uh, led by the Portuguese in the early 1400s, which is the 15th century. And all the European powers were involved in slavery. They themselves, of course, had been subjected to slavery by their fellow Europeans. But when they started coming, you'll remember that when the Portuguese started coming into Africa, they wanted to trade in gold and spices. But then they discovered that there was another commodity, the human being. And it is interesting that even the now very quiet European powers were involved in what later became the transatlantic triangle of slavery. The Danes were there. If you look at the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, in, the, in, in what is today Ghana, they participated in the building of it. The Swedes were there. The Norwegians were there. The Dutch were there. The British were there. The French were there. The Spaniards were there. The Germans were there. So modern day slavery as we know it 
was actually animated by the need for labor within Europe. And as I've already said, the Portuguese were in the forefront of it. And then initially they were taking the slaves to the motherland. So you'd find some uh, dark-skinned individuals in Lisbon, in, in Spain. And when they started conquering different parts of the world with the activities of individuals like Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus, you now begin to see slaves, African slaves being transported from the Western part, particularly Nigeria, Gambia, Senegal, Equatorial Guinea, and ultimately on the Southern part in Angola, being transported to what are now the Caribbean, to Jamaica, to Trinidad and Tobago, to St. Vincent's and Grenadines, to Brazil, to Colombia, to ultimately to Costa Rica. And when the Americans get involved in slavery, of course, they are then taken to the United States of America and even to parts of Europe. That then became known as the transatlantic trade. And records now show that nearly 12 million, and these are conservative estimates of Africans were taken to what were described as the new lands to work their lands. And it can't be said without fear of contradiction that America was built by black labor in the same way that Latin America was and the Caribbeans, and it was devastating. The impact of it is alive even as we speak because it involved the dehumanization of human beings and they are being treated as chattels and being sold as if they were not human beings. All slavery was dehumanizing. All slavery was demeaning. All slavery had a commercial aspect to it. There is no slavery that you can say was humane. And one of the things that they did was to take away people's cultures and people's language. You can say, for example, that in the Arab world, because of the lack of documentation, you don't see the descendants of slave in the, slaves in the manner that we see it in the United States of America or in the Caribbean. But one can say for one thing, that what they did was to convert people into chattels and it made those parts of the world richer. But the Arabs also did something else that uh, the transatlantic slave perhaps did not do as effectively as they did, is that some of them came into the hinterland and married. So you can see the process of Arabization. This is a similarity rather than a difference. The Arabization of the west of the eastern coast of Africa and the Islamization, because they came and in the process of enslaving, they also Islamize and Arabize. And you see people having names which are fundamentally Arab and Islamized. Uh, even the Arab names were Islamized. And then when you go to the, you know, the transatlantic trade, it was a complete transplantation of the people and the destruction of their culture so that people lost their languages. If you go to the United States of America, those who went there who are Yorubas, those who are Wolofs, those who are uh, Igbos, or those who are Temne, or those who are Mende, or those who are Ovambo, or those who are Ovimbundu, they all lost their culture so that you cannot trace their language. Conversely, the Arabs who came to what we now know as uh, uh, Swahil, which means the coast from which the word Swahili is derived, the languages were not lost, but they were Arabized. If you look at Kiswahili, which is fundamentally a Bantu language, you see that there is quite a little, a lot of borrowing uh, from, from the Arab language. So you can see those differences, but one of the most dangerous things that you see in the slavery in the Arab world was castration of men. This was unprecedented because in the transatlantic, they wanted the people to breed so that they would have more slaves. But in the Arab world, they simply castrated them. There were eunuchs who worked in the harems of the sultans of the day. That was as cruel as cruelty can be because they intended to decimate. But on the other hand, they bred them 
as you breed cows. They bred them as you breed rabbits, only that then they served as labor uh, in their farms and in their households. You know, <laughs> Christianity played a major part in giving legitimacy to slavery. We say it casually, but remember that the cross came before the flag. When Christianity came, the version of Christianity that was brought to us was a Christianity where you are supposed to turn the other cheek. It was a Christianity where they make reference to Paul's letter to the Romans and say, Obey your masters. You slaves, obey your masters as you would the Lord. So you can almost see an attempt to say that slavery is God-ordained. And when they are preaching, whether it's the Catholic Church, they are now all apologizing that they were complicit in slavery. The Anglican Church is agreeing that they were complicit in slavery. The Presbyterian Church is saying that they were complicit in slavery. So the church, as we know it, the organized church from Western Europe was part and parcel of the enslavement of Africa. And that we must never forget. And they made references to the Bible to legitimize this atrocity. So that is the reality. And the same can be said of Islam, that Islam also did recognize that there are certain people who are not believers who could therefore be enslaved. Religion, as we know it, is as guilty as guilt can be in the enslavement of peoples. And remember, it's not only African peoples who are enslaved, even other individuals or other, other groups of individuals in different parts of the world were enslaved and or dehumanized. If you go to the Latin America, the Arawak people uh, were, were decimated and religion was in the forefront. In the name of God, people are enslaved. In the name of God, people are dehumanized. In the name of God, Africans were turned into things. In the name of God, Africans were turned into commodities. Organized religion has every reason to apologize to those that were enslaved. Every civilization, as I've already said at the very beginning, in every society, people always tried to dehumanize those who did not belong to their communities. So there were wars among African nations and when people were themselves arrested, when the European colonizers and enslavers came, some of them, most of them initially did not go into the hinterland. What they then did was to enter into unholy alliances with some African chieftains and they hunted people who are not of their own or those who are prisoners and participated in the slave trade. I know some European revisionists try to use this to say that they do not owe Africa, but that is not the root cause. The kind of slavery that was being practiced within African societies, it did not lead to the massive commercialization that we then saw in the transatlantic trade. But it's true to say, that slavery was known in Africa, even before the advent of the Europeans, even before the advent of the Arabs. Slavery must be understood. Slavery and slave trade, these were Siamese twins. Slavery for its own sake as a punishment to individual that was captured perhaps did not have as much value as when people started trading in slaves. And if you visit and look at the history of some of the major Western institutions, some of the major Western insurance companies, some of the major Western shipping companies, some of the major Western banks, they are intimately connected to slavery because they were underwriting the delivery of slaves as commodities. 
they were receiving money for those who paid to purchase slaves. They were involved in the most lucrative commodity, more lucrative than gold, more lucrative than spices, more lucrative than diamonds. Remember, initially, when the interaction between Europe and America started, it was on trade. There was no slavery. When the Portuguese first made their foray into Western Africa in what is now Ghana or what is now uh, Senegal or in the Gambia, they were trading. And this was a relationship that uh, was of equals. But when they discovered that there is a commodity more valuable, this commodity can work. This commodity can deliver. This commodity can reproduce. Then they discovered something that they had never known about, and that is how the commercial dimension of slavery took a trajectory that was unprecedented in the world. In what is now the conceptual West, slavery became one of the things that nobody wanted to abolish because so much money was being made out of it. So much wealth was being made out of it. So that even when a country like the United States of America declares her independence in 1776 and fights a civil war, the civil war is a war where the southern part of the United States, which wants to retain slavery, cannot even begin to imagine that you can abolish slavery. So the commercial dimension of, of slavery is what we must always look at. Hence, slavery and slave trade. And if we are talking in conservative terms, I think slavery was a multi-trillion dollar industry if we dollar denominate it in, in modern day economics. If you look at uh, the history of human civilization, even in the context of slavery, even before the Europeans came to Africa to enslave Africans, they were enslaving themselves. You, if you look at the history of the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and how the British were enslaved by the Romans and how the Romans themselves were enslaving Greeks. So the history of human civilization has always been some kind of circle. There was a time when Africa was in the ascendance, when it was great architecture in, in Africa through the pyramids, when the Africans knew about uh, uh, astrophysics among the Dogon, they already were studying astronomy, when the Africans knew about uh, what the Europeans borrowed as the Pythagoras uh, theorem, what they borrowed as Euclid's law on science, when they knew about the law of gravity, Africa was in that space. Then that was destroyed, and we know when it was destroyed, when the great uh, walls of uh, Zimbabwe were destroyed, when the walls of Benin, Benin were destroyed, when Ile Ife in Yoruba was destroyed, when the libraries in Carthage and Timbukti were destroyed, when the pyramids were sucked. We know that. Then it shifted. If you go to the uh, civilization which is articulated very well in the Hindu Mahabharata, when in the Hindu, Hindu valley, Hindus valley, there was great civilization, great science, even nuclear physics was known in that area. Then you go to the Chinese civilization where they even knew about numbers. Then you come to the Arab Islam civilization where we have mathematics and chemistry. When Europeans were still living in caves and eating raw meat, so Europe had its own space and the European articulation of all these things, which borrowed from all these civilizations is what we see now. So that societies have always been intertwined and it would appear civilization moves from one people to the other. And uh, that is how we must understand. And whenever a civilization has reached a certain level, then they lord it over others. And that is how you can see that superior civilizations, superior in their understanding, when they are enjoying success in the science and in the arts, 
then they believe that everybody else is not civilized and therefore they ought to serve them and is in that context that they uh, they use religion they use science they use all these things to subdue and and Europe did that to good effect during the 15th century when their technology was doing better than everybody else, when their science was doing better than everybody else, when their military organization was better than everybody else, and then they subdued those others. But you can see that even that European power is beginning to diminish and other powers are beginning to rise and that slavery is also changing color and character as we continue to relate.